The reason I wanted to write a book about depression and spent so many years researching this is uh, for a quite personal reason. There were these two mysteries that were really hanging over me that I couldn't find the answers to at first. The first was, I'm 39 years old. Every year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased in Britain and across the Western world. I wanted to understand why. I wanted to understand partly for myself. When I was a teenager, I'd gone to my doctor and I'd explained that I had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me and I couldn't control it, I couldn't regulate it, I felt quite ashamed of it. And my doctor told me a story that I now realise was really oversimplified. My doctor said, we know why people feel this way, scientists have proved it. There's a chemical called serotonin in people's brains. It makes them feel good. Uh, some people are naturally lacking it or have an imbalance in it. Obviously, you're one of them. Uh, all we need to do is give you these drugs, you're gonna be fine. So I started taking an antidepressant called Siroxat, uh, which, and I got quite a lot of relief um, initially. For a couple of months I felt a lot better, quite a big boost. And then this feeling of pain started to come back. So I went back to my doctor. He said, clearly I didn't give you a high enough dose. He gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, this feeling of pain came back and I was really in that cycle of taking the drug, taking a higher dose, feeling a bit better and, it, and so on. Um, until for 13 years, I was taking the maximum possible dose you're allowed to take. At the end of which, I still felt like shit and I was experiencing all sorts of horrible side effects, huge weight gain, all sorts of problems. And I wanted to understand, well, what's going on here? Because I'm doing everything that I'm being told to do and I'm still in a lot of pain. Um, and there seems to be something going wrong in, all around me in the wider culture, what's going on here? Can it really be that there's just some malfunction in everyone's brains at the same time? Um, so I decided to go on a long journey to try to find the answer to these mysteries. I ended up travelling over 40,000 miles. I went to interview the leading experts in the world about what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. But what I learned is there's scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are indeed biological. Your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems. And there are real brain changes that begin when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out. But most of the causes, seven of them, they're not in our heads. They're factors in the way we're living. And that opens up a very different way of understanding why we feel like this and how we can find our way out. The leading expert at Princeton University, Professor Andrew Skull, says, these are his words, it's deeply misleading and unscientific to say depression is caused by low serotonin. One of the leading experts in Britain, Dr. David Healy, said, you can't even say that story's been discredited because it was never credited. There was never a time when half of the scientists in the field believed that was true. The reason we were told that story, the reason it got to me and I'm guessing lots of the people in this room, is because that's the story that the drug company pharmaceutical, you know, the pharmaceutical company's PR departments realized was the most effective way of marketing these drugs. Now that doesn't mean, the fact that that story is not true, doesn't mean there's no value in chemical antidepressants. Um, I think we need to have a complex, nuanced and honest conversation about chemical antidepressants. So, the leading expert at Harvard Medical School, Professor Irving Kirsch, taught me some of the most important things I think about this. So, depression is generally measured by something called the Hamilton scale. Hamilton scale goes from one, where you would be dancing around in ecstasy, maybe on ecstasy, to 51, where you would be acutely suicidal. The, the studies that the pharmaceutical companies wanted us to see, and the studies that they didn't want us to see, when you look at all of that data combined, on average, chemical antidepressants move us 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale. Also worth saying, 1.8 points ain't nothing, right? If you're in terrible pain, 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale can make a real difference. But it's also important to say, for most people who are depressed and anxious, that's not going to be enough to solve their depression and anxiety. And we know this from lots of evidence. Most people who go to their doctor with depression and are given chemical antidepressants become depressed again. Doesn't mean the drug has no value, does mean for most people it's not enough to solve the problem. One moment which really helped me to think a bit differently about this, I went to interview a South African psychiatrist called Derek Summerfield. And uh, Dr. Summerfield happened to be in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants in Cambodia. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, had never heard of these drugs. So they were like, what are they? And Derek explained, 
And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he said, what do you mean? He thought they were gonna talk about some kind of herbal remedy, right? Like Ginkgo biloba or something like that. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who one day, he worked in the rice fields and one day he stood on a landmine and he got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb and a few months later he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's really painful to work underwater with an artificial limb. I'm guessing it's pretty traumatic for this guy for obvious reasons. He's going back into the field where he was blown up. He started to cry all day. Within a short time, he refused to get out of bed. Classic depression. They said to Derek, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. And he said, what? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. It wasn't some irrational malfunction. They figured if they bought him a cow, he could become a dairy farmer, he wouldn't be in this position that was causing him so much distress. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Derek, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? <laughs> now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that it's just a biological problem in your brain, that sounds like a joke. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant, he gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to tell us for years. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not crazy, you're not a machine with broken parts, you're a human being with unmet needs, and what you need is love and practical support to get those deeper needs met. Our culture is good at lots of things, I'm glad to be alive today, but we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for people. And it's not the only thing that's going on by any means, but I think it's the key reason why this crisis is rising and rising as each year passes. So that can sound a bit, uh, I don't know, abstract. So I wanna give you some concrete examples. One of the causes of depression and anxiety that I write about is disconnection from other people. We are the loneliest society there's ever been. There's a study that asks Americans how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. There are more people who have nobody to turn to than any other option. We are just behind the Americans in the international league tables of loneliness. And I wanted to understand this better, so I spent a lot of time interviewing an amazing man called Professor John Cassiopo, who's at the University of Chicago. And, and Professor Cassiopo proved many things. So he showed, for a human being, if you become acutely lonely, that releases as much of the stress hormone cortisol into your bloodstream as if you were punched in the face by a stranger. Being acutely lonely is devastating for your health. It's as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being really quite obese. And I remember asking him, why? Why is being lonely so stressful? And him saying, why do we exist? Right, many reasons. One of them is our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down a lot of the time. They weren't faster than the animals they took down a lot of the time. But they were much better at banding together into groups and cooperating. Just like bees evolved to need a hive, humans evolved to need a tribe. And we are the first humans ever to try to disband our tribes. And if you think about those circumstances where we evolved, if you got cut off from the tribe, you were stressed and flooded with cortisol and anxious for a really good reason, right? You were about to die, you were in terrible danger. Those are still the impulses we have as human beings. That's the species we are. That's what we need. What's the, what's the antidepressant for that, right? What's so one of the heroes of my book, Lost Connections, is, is a man called Dr. Sam Everington, who's a doctor in East London, poor part of East London, he's a GP. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He had loads of patients coming to him with terrible depression and anxiety. And he'd been told in medical school, even though he knew the science was much more sophisticated, just tell them they've got a chemical imbalance, that they can't understand more sophisticated stories than that, um, and just drug them, right? And Sam was really uncomfortable with that. Like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they do have some value, but he could see they weren't solving the problem for a lot of his patients. So he decided to pioneer a different approach. One day, uh, a woman came to him called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know quite well. 
Lisa had been shut away in her home with crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to Lisa, don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also gonna prescribe something else. I'm gonna prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was known as Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like, uh, backed onto a park. He said to Lisa, what I'd like you to do is come and turn up a couple of times a week, meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people, I'm gonna turn out and support you, and we're gonna turn Dog Shit Alley into something nice. The first meeting they had, Lisa was physically sick with anxiety, literally. But a couple of things happened as the group kept on meeting. The first thing was, they discovered they had something to talk about that wasn't how shit they felt, right? Most of the time with depressed and anxious people, we either drug them or we give them a place to talk about their pain and both those things have value. But in this group, they had something completely different. They decided they were gonna learn gardening. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. These were inner city extenders, they didn't know anything about these things, right? They started to apply for a gardening qualification. And another thing happened, they started to form a tribe they started to form a group, and they did what human beings do when we form tribes. They started to solve each other's problems. For example, it's an extreme example, there's one guy in the group who'd been thrown out of his home and he was sleeping on the night bus, right? Everyone else in the group was like, of course you're depressed if you're sleeping on the night bus. They started pressuring the local council, Tower Hamlets Council, to get this guy a home. They succeeded, they got him a home. It was the first time they'd done something for someone else in years. It made them feel great. The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. <laughs>